ready to dive in. <laughs> so let's get started. So introduction. Hi. Hello, sweet soul. My name is Abby. I run an online tarot marketplace called AV Tarot Market. There we go. And I also run a private this as well. I am a psychic medium, but I use tarot as the mode of channeling the information from guides, from guardians, from ancestors, from deceased loved ones. Um, my overall goal in my tarot practice is to help others kind of bring them back to happy. That's how I talk about it, where I want my clients to understand what brings them joy. And then I want to help link them <laughs> to what brings them joy, help them see the steps to where they need to go to bring them joy. And tarot is the tool in which I use to do that, either client facing when I'm shuffling cards and channeling information, or even by myself when I'm pulling cards, laying out and spread and working that way. So why do I want to demystify tarot? Um, first thing is, is that there's so many misconceptions about what tarot is, where it comes from, what it's useful for, that the bigger the industry becomes, the more I feel like it needs to be introduced to others. It needs to be, um, ex I don't want to say exposed for what it is, but shared what it is because so many people like to gatekeep tarot, like to, um, throw in a ton of mystery, a ton of fantasy. And yes, that makes it fun. It makes it interesting and a little mysterious. And I'm all for, you know, the fun and games that we play. I'm all for it. However, sometimes the fun that we incorporate into our, our practice prevents it from being an actual approachable method. And that, that can't happen. Or at least in my humble opinion, <laughs> that can't happen. So Tarot has a long history of fear and dogma attached to it. Um, I've, well, my personal opinion is that any uh, tool that encourages self-thought and self-reflection is often pressed aside by people who don't understand it. And so understood completely. That's just what happens, especially with religious um, uh, things <laughs> in the days. But it's now becoming mainstream. You do one search on Instagram for tarot anything and you're going to get account upon account of daily reads, of weekly somethings, of um, energy of the week. Heck, I do a few of my own. So take a look at Instagram, take a look at Pinterest, maybe even do some deep dive into Facebook and you can find community after community after community devoted to tarot. So much, so much there. Um, another aspect of tarot that so many people don't always talk about at first is how much art there is in tarot. It's not just the, the classic images that we have come to know and understand and love with tarot, but there's some stellar, amazing, creative, dynamic art. This is the playful tarot um, from a local Seattle artist, and she does some just quirky and just play, literally playful imagery um, with her tarot cards. This is another artist named Anna Turin, and she is a sketch artist and does watercolor paintings. These aren't um, specifically her watercolor decks, but like the art is stunning, and it's emotional, and it's emoting. And my personal favorite, I have to show this one off. This is the True Black Tarot, and this is by far one of my favorite um, sets of cards. And I just love the nuance and then the play on light and dark. So there's so much art. And since every, well, most decks have about 78 to 79 cards in them, you have 78 to 79 beautiful works of art in just the palm of your hand. So why not like get invested, get involved, especially if you love art or in creative in that way. In addition, like tarot in itself is such a impactful tool for self-discovery, self-reflection, for, for instance, divination, um, predicting events, if you want to do forecasting. Um, it, with it being such a self-reflective, powerful, impactful tool, I can, I've can i seen it improve people's mental health, um, save your sanity. Um, for me, personally, it was a vital tool for me to navigate a space of time in my life where I was employed but had no work and didn't know where my next job was going and so all of that uncertainty all that upheaval tarot helped me feel like I was heard and wrapped the blanket around me and helped me feel comfortable and so being that tarot can do that it's no wonder that it's a 2.6 billion dollar industry that is only growing exponentially year over year so it's like we might as well introduce ourselves to tarot now <laughs> 
so that we know what it is, how to use it, how to capitalize on it, on it, and get some fun, get some fun in the process. So let's talk about it. What is tarot? Um, tarot, <laughs> for one thing, it is ink printed on paper. <laughs> it is a picture printed on paper. So that's the like the foundational level of what it is. It's a picture. It is a tool also for divination. It's also a tool for artistic expression. The other uses of tarot is method of channeling, um, self-healing. Uh, gosh, I use it for conversing with one of my uh, deceased relatives. Um, but ultimately, its common use is for divination or cartomancy. Um, often, people will have a question, shuffle the cards in relation to the question, pull the card, and then interpret the card in relation to the question. And that's often what is called like a reading or a read. Uh, just to give you a hyper brief <laughs> history of what tarot is, currently our verifiable information is that tarot has its foundational roots in 15th or 16th century Italy via a family called the Visconti. And that's basically because um, back then in those centuries, that time, um, the local aristocrats would play a game called Terucci. And this card game was created with 80 plus cards. And these cards uh, were representative of like the status of the family. So the Fusconti family commissioned a set of cards from a particular artist. And that happens to be the oldest uh, remaining surviving image of tarot-like symbolism in in history. <laughs> in history, it's the oldest oldest set of cards in the book. <laughs> so that card game spread throughout Europe, um, and you know made it its way to other countries, and it's kind of transformed um, from there. But in 1789, a French occultist produced the first deck of cards that was specifically designed for cardomancy. So he was actually the th person who coined that term and produced, so created and produced a deck of cards for the mode of divination. Once we move into the 20th century, um, we start having references and, of the Rider Waite Smith system of cards, the Thoth system, as well as other systems that have grown and kind of blended and evolved from there. So since I just mentioned it, systems, um, each, well, not each deck of cards, let me clarify there. Um, tarot cards often are categorized in what kind of system they follow. Now, most cards will follow what's called a right away Smith system. And by that, I mean the yellow cards that look like this, this system. This is the standard right away Smith deck. When you talk to any uh, tarot person and you say right away Smith, it's going to bring up images of that blue background, um, these yellow cards, and that's what we're referring to. There's other systems that are called Thoth, which is a um, different imagery style completely, while the meanings and the interpretations of the cards will parallel. And I want to make sure I reference that when you're working with a particular system, um, usually, like for instance, a Three of Swords is going to be the same here as it's going to be the same here as it's going to be the same regarding meaning here. So on often the art is created in alignment to what the interpretation of that card is. And so the artist will then um, interpret that meaning into an artistic format. And that turns into another set of cards. So there's the uh, Rider Waite Smith, the Thoth, um, before those two was the Marseille. And if I remember correctly, Marseille is a French, <laughs> a French deck of cards that was made um, specifically from woodcut impressions. And it is kind of a, if you're a little bit more of a traditionalist, uh, some people will lean to that because it was before these more mainstream editions occurred. So um, in addition, you might run into what's called Golden Dawn, and um, it's another one of the mystery schools from back in the day. I actually don't have a whole ton of knowledge on them because I tend to live within the right away Smith system. So it's like I, I've never di dived deep into it. But if you see references to it, you'll understand that it's another system of tarot divination. So let's talk about the construction of a tarot deck. So if I had enough sense, I would have separated this out for us. But um, to give you the high level overview of the construction of a deck of cards, there's two big parts of them. There's the major arcana, 
and the minor arcana. Now, the major arcana equals um, major secrets, right? Major secrets of life, because tarot in itself is supposed to be the entire encompassment of the lived experience, the human lived experience. So you have the major secrets and the minor secrets. So the major secrets being, let's see if I can pull an example quickly the hangman. So sometimes in life, you run into situations where you feel like you are suspended in midair. You can't make a decision. You can't move. There's nothing that can be done except wait, pause and wait. That's a life moment. Now you have more subtle, um, like little, so minor <laughs> secrets of the eight of pentacles. That's a, a suit in the cards, this is a minor card. And so this would talk about specifically the work in relation to whatever the question is. So you have the minor secrets, the major secrets, the big life events, little life events, if that makes sense. The cards are then further broken down into suits. So you have the wands, you have the cups, you have the swords, you have the pentacles. And that also has an elemental association to wands being fire, Cups being water, swords being air, and pinnacles being earth. And if you want to take that a step further, um, often fire wands is ideas. So if we're thinking about like the creative expression of ideas, the birthing of ideas, um, water is often deeply related to emotion. So the feels, uh, when you go into swords, that's the thoughts, that's the brain power, that's this hyper analytical end of conversations often. And then if we move into pentacles, that is often the more tangible reality or even monetary aspect of reality. So you can use all of those little tidbits to kind of add nuance and flair to the information that is coming for you. So how does tarot work? You know, I would love to say that there is a consensus on how it works, but as far as I have ever researched and understood in the community in which I lived in, no one has really cemented how tarot works. Now, most people talk about it as like a psychological experience that you will find meaning in this card, like an ink blot kind of thing. And that it's information is coming from the inside of the mind outward instead of the picture inward, for instance. Um, other people believe in a more, a little bit animist kind of point of view where the cards themselves harbor a spirit or a soul. And it's that soul that's communicating with you. Now, I personally happen to be some sort in the mid ground where it's like, yeah, there's the psychological image of that. There's the psychological pull to it. But for me personally, I feel like my cards are just a mode of communication. It's like watching TV in cards, you know, it's a mute, it's a mode, it's a mode, it's a method and mode for me, but that's just me. And the cool thing about tarot is that there is no right way to tarot. So it's like you find what works for you, you work with the experience that you have, and you're going to run into people that are not going to agree. <laughs> Let that be them. <laughs> Let that be them. Those are just my thoughts on on how tarot works. So let's talk about the mechanics of a reading or a session or what have you. So first of all, tarot, I feel, works best when we come to the cards with a thought in mind. Now, some people do what's called like general readings where they just kind of come in and go for the experience. I find that to be really, really vague for the cards and can be very vague for the person who's trying to interpret the cards that they have. And it gets complicated when it doesn't have to be. So to keep it easy, you come to the cards with a question or you think of a question in mind and and you hold that in your head or write it down. I write it down because I want to know what I asked. Write down the question and then I shuffle that question into the cards. So by shuffling it into the cards, I'm just saying I'm thinking about the question while I'm shuffling the cards. Now, shuffling the cards, you do what works, right? There's no right way to shuffle. Regardless of what anybody says, there's no right way to shuffle. So all you're trying to do is create randomness in the cards. Now, some people believe that spirit is kind of controlling or dictating how the cards are landing in this layup. Great, who cares? I just want to make sure I create enough variety in this shuffling process that um, I'm not making it predictable or repeat of the same cards I just had before. So I'm just creating randomness. That's all I'm asking for out of these cards. Now you can totally shuffle nine million ways to shuffle. Let's see if I can do this without like spraying my cards everywhere. Like rifle shuffling, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Bridge. Dude, I did that in midair. I'm kind of proud of myself. There's so many ways to shuffle. You can totally throw your cards on the um, on your table space and kind of washing machine around them, scoop them back up and lay your cards from there. 
Um, often people take the top card and lay it down. The way that I like to do it is I shuffle like this and I feel a nudge to stop and I grab the card that I feel pulled to. So, and for me that works. Um, so, I mean, you can use that process. You can use whatever process that works for you. There's, again, there's not a firm, hard, fast rule regarding how to draw your cards. So once you've shuffled the cards, you then pull the cards like we just showed, and then you interpret the cards in relation to the question that you have at hand. So for instance, I have a question. King of Pentacles then shows up. I have to interpret the meaning of this card in relation to the question. And so it gets interesting and complex. Not really, it doesn't have to get complex, but it can. And so that's why I find that writing the question down makes it super easy and um, keeps you cemented because often cards get lost in the details. <laughs> so it's like, if you aren't clear about what you're looking for, um, then the cards are gonna, gonna not exactly be clear either. So the more clear of a question you provide, the more clear of a response that you will be receiving. So learning the cards. Now, one thing I wanna make sure that I don't like expose too much on, cause we're gonna talk about common misconceptions in a moment, but um, you don't have to learn or have all the cards memorized before you start working with them. Like you can pull your cards out of the box tonight and start working with them right away. Please do. I love diving headfirst into a new new something. So I would love to give that to you. But there's lots of methods of um, learning the cards. And often one thing that everybody usually starts off with is just doing a daily draw. And by that, I mean you uh, go to wherever your cards are. You shuffle your cards and maybe think of like, what do I need to know today? And you take the card that you feel drawn to. I want to use a different card. There we go. You take the card that you feel drawn to and you look up this definition. You look up what this classic meaning of this card is. Maybe write it down in your journal. Maybe uh, leave it out in your altar space if you have one. Put it in your wallet. Take it to work with you. Whatever, whatever works for you. And see how the energy of that day or what happened in that day is similar or aligns with that card. And just to see. It's just to help you see correlation and also help you see uh, what the meanings are. Um, when you get done with the one a day or you get bored with the one a day, uh, start doubling it up. Do one in the morning, one in the evening. Also, don't stop there. You can completely do like three card spreads and start to learn how the cards start to play with each other in regards to interpretation or meaning. Now, often people ask about reversals. When you're just starting out with, with tarot, you don't have to read reversals. Some people like are hard, like no, reversals are part of it. Eh, I mean, you could, but you don't have to. You, okay, take it from an Abby. You don't have to read reversals, especially at first. I actually bounce back and forth depending on the set of cards that I'm using on if I'm going to read reversals or not. But to not digress, <laughs> after you move from like three card readings, why don't you uh, kind of open open it up a little bit more into like weekly energy or monthly lesson, for instance, or kind of the questions that you uh, run into. And you can always, always, always go online and find a plethora of spreads of ideas of methods. There's so much community surrounding tarot. Um, it's it's wonderful to be embraced by like a mutual topic that everybody enjoys. So I'm thoroughly hoping that you take this topic and this idea and run with it. Oh, something that I love to do. I love to love to do this. And I wish I had more time. Um, actually, speaking of time, I'm going to create the time I need to actually do this because I like it so much. It's called the nesting process um, or a nesting spread is kind of what I've dubbed it. And basically what it is each week or each Sunday for me, that's my day off off <laughs> each Sunday I pull a card which is um, going to describe for me the energy of this week now it could be a card or a three card spread or, or what have you I want to understand the energy of that week now each day of that week I'm pulling one more card to further explain or understand what my previous cards meant so to me it's like asking my cards to talk about the previous cards. And it's like a nesting process, like a little nesting doll. So that's why I call it nesting. And I track all that information in my planner or in my journals so that I can reflect on it over time, see the correlation, see how maybe the month ebbed and flowed for me um, and see what the common themes are. Maybe there's something to work on. So I am excited to hop into common misconceptions. Those are actually my favorite because I love debunking things. <laughs> so... <sighs> Let me exhale first. Do you need to be psychic in order to read tarot? Hard stop, no. Um, 
working with tarot will increase your psychic acuities, but you don't need to be psychic in advance or even intuitive in advance. There's lots of um, readers who kind of sit on a couple different camps when it comes to how tarot is read. Some people are very analytical readers where the king of pentacles means the king of pentacles means the king of pentacles. I happen to be a little bit more of what does the king of pentacles signify for me, which may be different than what that reader says it means because tarot is my tool. <laughs> so if I'm giving the reading, the interpretation is going to be my interpretation, but that's how I read. So I would consider myself instead of an analytical reader, I'm very much more of a free form uh, rebel reader <laughs> is how I would talk about it. Um, when, uh, when you're new, um, some people get kind of caught up in the idea that they have to have all 78 cards memorized before they're able or allowed to give readings. And I would say, for instance, if you are trying to go professional with your work, then it's usually faster to have all of your card, most of your cards memorized, but no one says that you have to. I mean, there's, for instance, we don't shy too badly when our doctor looks at his books to give us information. So there's not really anything wrong with you referencing um, your guidebook when you're kind of on the fence about a meaning. So no, you don't have to have all the cards memorized before you start working with them or working with others. Must your first deck of cards be gifted? Hard stop, no. Um, I don't know where that original um, idea came from. I was um, under the camp of my first set of cards was gifted to me, but it was more of a hostage exchange rather than like a gift. My mother caught me in the middle of my bedroom in ritual with a bunch of candles around me and she thought I was gonna burn the house down. So she gave me a deck of cards instead. It's like, here, you do this, honey. <laughs> So I was like, okay, <laughs> that's what I did. But no, your first deck of cards does not need to be gifted for them to work. Go shopping, find what resonates for you, find artwork that you love, pick out a Rider Waite Smith deck to learn with, and then pick out a deck of cards that you're attracted to the art so that you continue to come back, you continue to play and you get invested and involved. Another question I sometimes get from people is, do um, does tarot attract dark or evil energy? And that is such an interesting question because I understand that comes from a lot of like pop culture, a lot of religious, you know, uh, question marks there. And I don't feel like, let me give you this. Um, it is my lived experience that I have never encountered evil or dark energy while working with tarot to the point where I don't know if it's my team. I got a great team or if it just doesn't show up for me. So I work with how I work. I provide what I provide and it's never been an experience that I've had to run into. So from what I understand, no, <laughs> that is my lived experience with tarot. Um, some people ask if the more dark cards like the death card or the tower card, if um, that actually means like death or dying. And that's also going to be a hard no because the death card in tarot speaks of transformation. It's the dying of the old and the resurrecting of the new because death is a cycle, right? It's the, you are here, you're gone, oh, but something else happens. But it, it, it also can be referred to as like a deeply transformative experience. So when the death card shows up for me in a session or in a reading or something for myself, it's actually a, an interesting card to have because something is going to move. Something's going to change. I don't know what it is. And often the rest of the reading will talk to me about what it is. Is. But at that moment, when it shows up, it's not a card to be afraid of. The tower is another one of those cards where sometimes we don't want to see the tower. Um, for instance, think of the tower as like a home, the home that you built with your friends, your family, your loved ones, a stack of cards. The tower, the foundation got cut out from underneath it. So things come down. Sometimes we have to dismantle something in order to change it. And so for me, when the tower shows up, it can be alarming, but something had to change. The foundation had to be shook because there's something else bigger going on. So that's how I pull in harder cards into a session because it's still necessary. It's still a lived experience. It's still something that has to happen. Can tarot predict the future? <laughs> so for me, I find that um, future is not written in stone. It is written in sand. So we are still given free will and choice. So any predictive element to tarot gives you a likelihood of outcome is my understanding of it. 
Um, if something is more than like 50% going to happen, it's likely to happen. If it's like 10% going to happen, it's probably not going to happen. So for me, when I am doing predictive work, I think of it on a scale because black and white, yes or no, things going to happen. It may not be that black or white. So while yes, I think it can predict the future, it's more giving me the likelihood of probability. You know another one? Um... A lot of people sometimes believe that using used cards is like the equivalent of using somebody else's toothbrush. And I hope that you actually don't carry that belief because you there's so much time and there's so much history in tarot that your chances of coming across a deck that's been used before are really, really high. I actually have a business supporting the use and um, rehoming of used cards. And there's so much beautiful artwork that needs a place to be. There's so much beautiful artwork that needs a new home. So why limit ourselves to new commercialized products only? And there's so many... Um, oh gosh, what would I say? Like independent creators that are creating cards and they've used them a few times or maybe they've gotten them brand new and got it manufactured and sent to you. But definitely let's not allow, there it is, let's not allow its condition to affect if we're going to use it or not. So resources. <laughs> so my whole thing is that I hope when you leave here that you feel empowered enough to select your own set of cards and go home and play. Essentially, I do suggest that you put, pick out two decks of cards, one deck for learning and one deck to love. And that sounded terrible. One set of cards to love, one set of cards to learn. <laughs> Um, some of my favorite people in the tarot industry is Biddy Tarot Online. She's an Australian-based company that does a lot, a lot, a lot of content on learning tarot, but also flipping from being just the learner into the practitioner or service provider. Uh, Binabel Wen is another um, tarot uh, author and creator who is so knowledgeable. She's active on social media and she is such a smart woman who is a prolific creator of free content and resources directly on her website. And we are getting close on time, so I don't wanna keep you here for too much longer. Kellyanne Maddox is another person that you'll find on YouTube. She's a wonderfully psychological uh, tarot reader who's super smart and has um, a wealth of knowledge in relation to tarot and mental health. So she's a wonderful resource uh, regarding knowledge and information and education in that regard. So I definitely recommend uh, looking her up. Avalon Cameron is a folk magic witch from Brazil, and she lives in Australia and Tanzania as of right now, but she is a prolific content creator and educator. Like she wants to educate people on tarot. So she is a wonderfully accessible, a wonderfully, oh God, I love the way she channels speech. And so she's so fun to listen to. So I, I definitely throw her out as a resource, like get involved, get invested, get to know that energy, that person. Also, after you've gotten your first deck of cards, I thoroughly recommend going to Tarot Nerds on Facebook. It is a massive community. For me, I think it's the biggest community on Tarot inside Facebook. And I know many of the people in there, I've made some wonderful friends in there, um, but I know my friend Tabitha runs a monthly beginners reading circle. Um, another friend runs a book club in there. Um, another friend does like uh, draws of the day, weekly pulls, and then people do free readings in there all the time to practice, to learn. So we all start with being nervous to even pretend like we're going to get on camera. And then you turn into uh, people who are like prolific on camera readers where their, their skills are shifting and evolving. And you get to watch it happen live. So I thoroughly recommend that as a resource. Now, I do want to point out that counterfeit cards is actually a thing. And it's a big deal within the tarot industry and the tarot community right now because of copyright laws. So until you have learned how to spot a fake set of cards, I would suggest that you limit your shopping to reputable places. U.S. Game Systems is an online publisher for tarot. Big publisher. They're the biggest in the country. Llewellyn is another online publisher and resource of metaphysical books, as well as tarot and oracle. Hay House is another one that's a little bit more modern. Um, same thing, online publisher of books, cards, audio resources, events, other things. Um, my own store has a ton of used and new tarot cards. So I make a point of 
delisting or not even getting to the point of being listed any cards that show up fake for me. And so they don't even make it to the site. So you can trust that one. Also, Kickstarter is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place to um, find new cards because you have to have patience with them because they're in the process of manufacture, but they're so interesting. They're so dynamic. They're so new. And so if you get bored with what is mass produced, Kickstarter is a wonderful place to get a hold of something dynamic and new. And then watch Kickstarter on Tarot Nerds and you can see the community get excited about new cards, new publications, new editions and things of that nature. So to wrap it up neatly in a bow. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that I was able to pull back the curtain and kind of pull some of the mystery out of tarot for you. I hope, I hope, I hope that with this communication or with this conversation, um, this helped you feel a little bit more comfortable about maybe going to your store, um, your bookstore or your metaphysical shop and selecting a set of cards for yourself that it is an approachable tool that is beneficial and useful and it has so many applications it is literally i feel like limitless the applications for tarot are limitless so you can use it for anything from like channeling messages from the ancestors finding lost items within your house um checking on the energy of a meeting that's going to happen how can you present yourself better the next time you see your mother-in-law um what is it that your spouse actually meant when they said that thing there's so many applications for tarot and not just adults but young young people can use tarot too and actually get a lot out of it so i thoroughly thoroughly recommend that you get your own tarot deck you explore you have some fun with it and you have fun so take care you all thank you